project plans are built around checklist items. Yeah. And you may miss 20, 30, 40, 50% of what's actually happening in a system. Right. And sometimes those are minor issues. Yeah. But sometimes they are huge business process requirements that all of a sudden, you know, somewhere along the implementation, they pop up and somebody goes, hey, how did we miss that? Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now... Here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm Elevate IQ. ERP implementations are easy, right? Anyone can do it. But ironically, anyone can fail it as well. So how can ERP implementation be so easy and difficult at the same time? There are several reasons, but the core reason is how ERP systems are selected and implemented. Most companies follow a checklist approach, and this approach often results into hit or miss scenario because creating a generalized checklist approach for ERP implementation is nearly impossible, especially for the processes that might be happening outside the ERP system. In today's episode, our guest, Peter Jackal, shares his insights into the concepts of shadow ERP and how that drives ERP implementation failure. He also discusses how measuring and understanding the shadow ERP processes can result into the better outcome for your ERP implementation. Finally, he shares his insights into the importance of data plumbing and the challenges associated with having multiple software systems in the architecture. Let me introduce Peter to you. Peter Jekyll is the president and founder of Churn On Dynamics, a boutique consulting specializing in providing senior consulting resources for Microsoft Dynamics AX D365 clients and projects. Peter Jekyll has been a leader in mid market ERP market since 1986 when his company installed some of the first network-based manufacturing systems in the country. He has been consistently been recognized for his ability to match the right solution for a customer's needs rather than pushing boxes of software. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hey, Peter. Welcome to the show. This is it, huh? This is it. This is the moment, right? And we are going to be talking about so much exciting stuff. And obviously, you have spent 30 years doing this. So it's going to be so much fun. Just to kick things off, if people don't know you, do you want to start with your personal story and current focus, Peter? Uh, certainly. How much How much time do you want to take for this? I can take a minute or uh, an hour. <laughs> yeah. And let, let's keep it probably two minutes. Obviously, you are going to have a lot of fun stories. And we want to make sure that we are able to cover those as well. <laughs> sure. Sure. So uh, as you mentioned, um, I've been in the ERP industry for over 30 years. And as I tell people, the only good thing about that is it's not 40 years. Um, I have an interesting background as yep. a, I have an engineering degree uh, in industrial engineering, which um, kind of led very nicely into manufacturing yep. uh, consulting. And out of college, I went to work at Price Waterhouse which at the time was a big eight and which gives you another indication of how old I am. <laughs> and my first, my first ERP experience was implementing Mapix and yeah. Mapix at the time, manufacturing, accounting, production, inventory control system was kind of the SAP Oracle, yeah. you know, big uh, enterprise product at the time. And so I learned, you know, kind of that ERP sales implementation consulting business uh, at Price Waterhouse, and then uh, very shortly after that, stepped into the uh, 
you know, to that mid-market uh, ERP uh, yeah. software and worked with uh, Computer Associates, worked with Macola, yeah. Cispro, then the Great Plains, and then migrated to the AX and uh, now the FNO, kind of that flagship uh, Microsoft product. Yeah. And so I uh, had an interesting journey. And I think, interestingly enough, all of the jobs that I've had, including my education, is kind of perfect for manufacturing, ERP, implementation, selection. Okay, very cool. And I love to talk to people who have dealt with many different ERP systems because then you are going to have slightly broader perspective in terms of what works and what does not work. So we are going to be spending a lot of time discussing in, in those best practices. Uh, but before right. we do that, we have one of the standard questions that we ask every single guest, uh, Peter. Yes, and sir. that is going to be your perspective on business growth. You know, the interesting thing to me is what we do, uh, everybody needs. So everybody has to have an ERP system of some type. They do, yeah. And so uh, for me, the growth is always um, that next level of technology that uh, you know publishers are adding. And so between everybody needing this uh, type of software to be competitively, you know, at a, not to be at a competitive disadvantage, and the fact that the technology changes so dramatically. Yeah, almost from year to year sometimes. Yeah. Um, I see that there is unlimited growth opportunity in our industry. I would say, you know, what's probably more important is that the resources to be able to do this stuff well yeah. probably lag behind the growth of the, the industry. So there's, uh, there's a ton of opportunity uh, in our industry to, uh, to have employment. Yeah, so very cool and very interesting perspective. And this is probably going to be a sort of good point where we are probably going to be, uh, you know, moving to our next conversation. Uh, but one of the comments that you mentioned that, you know, what ERP means growth. But now when you look at the the market landscape at this point of time, um, you look at things as, such as your industry 4.0, you look at e-commerce, every system is sort of growing their boundary at this point of time. And they also yeah. talk about, you know, how much, SaaS and no code, low code is going to be so prominent. And that right. of ERP is another concept that people are talking about. So I yeah. am not too sure. And by the way, when you move from one industry to the next, the ERP right. looks very different in terms of how or what they think of an ERP system. I'll be adding more colors to that story as I am mm -hmm. having more conversation with my customer. But do you want to share right. any sort of commentary there overall from your perspective where you see the ERP as of today? Do you really trust these guys who are saying that, you know what, it's all going to be SaaS. ERP does not exist. It's all going to be these tiny, mini apps that are going to be integrated together. And in my mind, I don't feel that these guys really understand the integration, how challenging that could be. So what what's your perspective overall when you look at the, the overarching ERP and, and, and growth? Yeah, so the SaaS is interesting to me because it's another example uh, from my perspective, having done this for so long where uh, additional technology oftentimes makes ERP more expensive, yeah. more complex to install, and harder to maintain. So if you think about the technologies that we've seen in my lifetime, yeah. Windows, the, uh, the mouse, the browser, yeah. and everything having to be, you know, everybody wanting to move to the cloud, yeah. um, those have all been touted as technologies that are going to improve ERP software in some fashion or another. In reality, when you take a look at all of these technologies from the standpoint of the end user, a lot of these things have actually made the job of inputting data and keeping a system up and running more complex. The other, the other thing that I've noticed in, you know, and I, this was kind of an epiphany one day for me is when I started my career in ERP, we worked with the business as far as deciding what system to pick, how to run these projects and IT supported the business. That's completely flipped on its head today yeah. with technology has become so complex that 
really most of the projects that we see today, they're run by IT. Yeah. And the, uh, you know, the business folks are almost scared of the technology because it's become so complex. So the cloud, to me, it's a, uh, it's a plus and a minus because it does make things in a lot of cases, especially on an enterprise side, much more yep. challenging. But of course, from a marketing standpoint, it's all super simple and easy. I know. Just move to the cloud and all your problems will be solved, right? Yep, yep. Uh-huh. So let's dig a little bit deeper into that. So when you say, and I don't think a lot of people, especially my listeners, they would understand why cloud is going to be more difficult. And they don't really understand that, you know what, even if you are using a very mm-hmm. tiny, tiny app, if that is going to be part of your operational core where your transactions are going to be connected, you know, you still have to worry about all the IT problems that you had. Traditionally, IT is not gone. Okay. It's just, right. you know, making it easier for you so that I yeah. am sort of isolating the technical details. But as such, mm-hmm. you know, those IT uh, details are still very important. In fact, more important because, you yeah. know, in the earlier days, you were sitting in your data center. Nobody really cared about it. If you're a small shop, who cares? But now, right. let's say if you are going to be opening up on the internet, you are exposing it to the whole world. And if you don't really mm. understand the cybersecurity fundamentals, obviously you are going yep. to be in trouble. So from your perspective, when you say the cloud is going to be challenging for the uh, enterprise companies, mm. do you want to provide some more uh, colors there? Sure. Sure. Let's think about this for a second. Yeah. The typical life cycle of a company is everybody starts off on QuickBooks. Yep. And then they move into some kind of a mid-market product. And from where I come from, Microsoft, you know, back in the day, it was like a Great Plains. Yeah. yeah. And then they graduate to something like an AX or an FNO. Yeah. And then if they outgrow that, they want something like an SAP or an Oracle. Yeah. Okay. And so there's this there's this growth 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 path uh, in yeah. their lives that we typically see in all companies. Now, something like a QuickBooks. Yeah. Where every single person uses the exact same software with a limited number of users, it's a perfect cloud application. Yeah. Because there's not a lot going on there. Everybody mm-hmm. is, you know, they're all confined to this one little space, all doing things exactly the same. Yeah. And if any one company has an issue, QuickBooks is not sitting on the back end going, oh my God, this three user system has some kind of problem. You know, we need to you know, we need to panic here on yep. the back end. Now, you change that to enterprise uh, level companies moving into the cloud and the publishers trying to make it, you know, where they can economically have lots and lots of companies moving into the cloud. Yeah. And so you move into this scenario where they have to enforce some kind of rules where everybody gets updated on a regular basis. And everybody's staying on the same version of the software. And you, so you have all of these challenges that make the software affordable in the cloud, yep. but then also make it manageable in the cloud. And because enterprise uh, type companies don't just work in that vacuum of the ERP system yep. from that ERP publisher, they may be integrated with legacy systems. Yeah. That are needed to run their business on a daily basis. They may have multiple ISVs or third-party products that are talking back and forth. Yeah. And so there you have tons of opportunities for transactions that have to go in and out of that cloud application. Yeah. And, you know, I always tell people this, it's not those applications that are the issue, you know, with an ISV solution or with a legacy system. It's the plumbing. Yes, exactly. The pipes that move data back and forth that sometimes are very easy to break. Yeah. And so you have, you know, once you get to a legacy system and a big, you know, uh, a big enterprise customer and some of those pipes break, now it's a three fire, you know, it's a three alarm fire at Microsoft, at the company, at the ISV, everywhere. So there are much, much bigger opportunities for things to, you know, go wrong. Yeah. And so that's so the so that's the that's that challenge. How do you keep everybody on the same software? How do you keep all those pipes running, you know, smoothly? And so and how do you set this software up so yeah. it's economically affordable? So those are 
you know, those are multiple moving components that, you know, not everybody gets right or, uh, you know, uh, will have right going forward because everybody continuously has that arms race of adding new functionality, you know, new capabilities. And so you're always changing up how the software, you know, how, how the software looks. And then those pipes have that opportunity to be challenged. So it's, a, it's an interesting world. Yeah, so some very interesting layers there. And, you know, to your comment about everybody sort of using QuickBooks, and I don't know if QuickBooks is really designed for that. Okay, so QuickBooks, when you look at the foundation of the database and you are a technical guy, Peter, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, QuickBooks does not really have the SQL backing. It's not really designed to run the no. enterprise level workloads, even if you are talking about, all. right? So, right. and by the way, I mean, see the way people or the companies use QuickBooks is very different as well. For some yeah. companies, they are going to think that accounting system means, okay, I am doing my GL, I'm also doing my AR Correct. and AP and operations and, and inventory and right. everything, and that's probably ERP for them. But let's look at some of the legacy business models. When I say legacy mm -hmm. business models, these are going to be, for example, any of the retail shops. The way they work and the way they think, they are still very legacy because they never had to sort of worry about reconciling these transactions in real time. So the way, even if you are going to go for, let's say, $50, $100 million retail companies, the way they work is, okay, they are going to have e-commerce and, and POS. So that sort of becomes their core. And they are going to feel that WMS probably plays much bigger role. So they go directly mm. from your e-commerce to your WMS. And finally, mm. you know, in a week, they are probably going to reconcile the books. And the okay. only thing you have in your ERP mm. system, by the way, the ERP system is going to be customer-less ERP. Meaning it's not going to have any uh, any sort of customers inside ERP. So the only thing you are doing, you are doing plus minus to your GL accounts. Not right. now, that's not even complete accounting in my mind, right? So that's right. the reality that we are looking at. So, so uh, you know, when you look at the QuickBooks, and in my experience, even people use QuickBooks very differently. So this is not really of a course. system issue. This is a business issue that businesses don't oh, understand how they should be, right? Yeah. And I think my point was more that... Uh, it's easier to run QuickBooks on the, you know, for both on the publisher side and yep. on the user side because it's so small, it's self-contained. Yep. And that's perfect for the cloud. Once you get these more sophisticated systems, and like you mentioned, integrating with legacy hardware on a retail side. Yeah. Now, again, that plumbing and that entire that entire uh, system that has to be maintained of all those moving parts becomes much more complex. Um, when you're the ERP solution sitting in the cloud. Okay, so very interesting. So here, I am actually going to go back to my story, and I don't know if you have any similar stories that you might be able to share. But mm. in this particular story, when you are talking to these retail guys, and we have seen like massive, mm -hmm. massive retail ERP failures. And the reason for mm. those is because the retail businesses feel that, you know what, I'm actually going to go omni-channel. Okay, and omni in their mind, omni-channel is going to be Okay, I have my e-commerce, I have my POS, and they are mm -hmm. going to be doing the transaction. Then I go to my WMS, and that's it, I'm done. Right. I'm going to forget my accounting. Accounting is probably going to be in the back end, right? That's how they think. But typically, with the omni-channel architecture, you have to have your inventory centralized. And that inventory has to sit in one system. And the point that you are trying to make is you have to have one system, you know, and all of your teams must be operating on one system. And whether you want to call right. that ERP or whatever you want to call but you have Correct. to have your inventory and the financials, at least the 70% of that integrated as part of one system. If you want to use other systems as part of the, right. the periphery, you can use that, but you have to have those 70% business processes as part of one system. So uh, do you have any sort of story or commentary there by any chance? Yeah, I think you know some of the most challenging projects that we've worked on, for example, if you uh, interface with uh, like Amazon, yeah, and you have to keep your system in sync with whatever Amazon is pushing back and forth. Exactly. Because you could be a multi-billion dollar company from a, you know, revenue standpoint on your side. Yeah. But from the Amazon standpoint, you're still a gnat on the elephant's back. Exactly. exactly. But if your system isn't capturing those transactions, financial and inventory related transactions yeah. with Amazon on a, you know, minute by minute basis, yeah. They can do without you. You can't do without them. Yeah. So, yeah. 
so let's say if you were to draw the architecture and let's say if you were to advise my you know folks in the warehouse because you know let's say if they feel that erp is a thing of a past um, you know right now we are living in a world of fast where we are going to get these fragmented applications we are going to get pos mm-hmm. we are going to get e-commerce because they are probably going to require pos because you need that store level omni channel experience they are probably going mm-hmm. to get e-commerce e-commerce is probably going to be integrated with pos and then they are going to have this direct integration either with tiny uh, tms such as your ship station or pay chat or whatever and then they might have a little integration with wms as well so in this architecture let's say if they feel that they are not going to have that erp layer in the background do you feel mm-hmm. this is going to work is this not going to work what kind of challenges uh, can they expect let's say if they uh, uh, do the omni challenge in this architecture yeah so the thing that we find in um in my experience is that when system requirements are looked at for migrating to a new system yeah um what happens is that those uh, the vast majority of those requirements are done with um an interview process yeah. off of some kind of a checklist yeah and so here is your existing system and uh, a vendor that even that has very great knowledge detailed knowledge of your specific industry yeah. and product that may fit you very very well the process of figuring out exactly what your requirements are by and large in our industry is a set of checklists that's been developed you know a long time ago yep uh, these checklists may have come down you know with Moses originally yep you know as part of the 10 commandments so they, yeah, I know. they just didn't talk about them yeah and what you typically have is you have uh junior consultants yeah that go through the checklist and say yep. And then they interview folks and say yes I do this yes we don't do that yes we do that we don't do that and then based on those checklists uh we build the architecture on how we're going to migrate from an existing system to a new system right the thing that we've noticed is that those types of checklists processes sometimes miss a huge amount of the detail i know of what of what we've termed um shadow ERP okay and we term shadow ERP as all of the things that an ERP user okay has to accomplish to do their job but that happen outside the ERP system because they have to jump in and do some data manipulation in excel for example yeah and those things if you dig into most sophisticated implementations there can be dozens and hundreds of those that are never surfaced to managers or you know the consulting team that comes in that's trying to figure out what that new system has to look like and so what happens is that project plans are built around checklist items yeah and you may miss 20 30 40 50% of what's actually happening in a system right and sometimes those are minor issues yeah. but sometimes they are huge business process requirements that all of a sudden you know somewhere along the implementation they pop up and somebody goes hey how did we miss that exactly oh change order oh we're not <laughs> going live in january right we're going live in july exactly so so that's one of those things that we've noticed and we've worked hard to address and to dig into those uh with processes and tools yeah. so that we find all of that information up front instead of having it surprise us uh during an implement halfway through an implementation so let's talk about shadow erp a little bit more so what is that is that more of a concept are you trying to suggest that you know when mm-hmm. you are going through these checklists uh, obviously the uh, you know solution could be that you are probably going to replace those junior consultant with somebody who really knows what they are doing if you have that then probably the solution is probably going to be better <laughs> yeah so so a big big question yeah um, yeah i'm going to try to give you some examples yeah, please. that somebody that's not 100 miles deep into erp could still understand yeah okay so the the term shadow erp came from the concept of shadow it yeah so imagine you're working at a company that has a big it department Yeah and they're in charge of installing software and they don't want you bringing stuff software from home and they don't want you randomly downloading stuff 
Yeah. They want to control exactly what's on your company computer. Exactly. But all of that stuff that you decide, oh, I need this, that the IT department doesn't know about, that's called shadow IT. Yeah, yeah. Let's take that concept over to the uh, accounting world where people spend, you know, millions sometimes of dollars putting in an ERP system. Exactly. And there, there are always training issues or setup issues always. or uh, matching issues yep. where the people that have to run the business on a day to day basis, they're looking on their screen saying, oh, wait a minute, I need to pull data out of the ERP system, work on it over here either on a you know manual thing or an Excel, and then move some data back to move forward. A lot of that stuff that these people have to do outside of the ERP system because of bad training, bad fit, bad setup, yeah. we're terming that shadow ERP. Okay. Because all the folks that are looking at the ERP system, they don't even realize it's happening. Right. And so... So what that does is it creates an entire level of workflow independent of the ERP system that, again, people don't understand. And so your system may not be running as well as it could from a day-to-day -day standpoint, right. or you're not going to identify those things if you're going to upgrade or if you're going to get a new system. And like you said, the only way to find them is to have like that army of industrial engineers watching what people do. Exactly. And times, that's impractical. So we've developed a tool that uh, we install and run at a customer or prospect yeah. that measures ERP usage and shadow ERP components and checks out how much of, a t how much of the daily uh, usage is outside of the ERP system and does it make sense. So we also have the concept of the ERP ratio, okay. uh, shadow ERP ratio. So think about this for a second. If I'm the controller yeah, and I spend 10% of my time in the ERP system, right. looking at data, yeah. pulling it down into a spreadsheet yep. and doing forecasting, what ifs, et cetera. Yeah. If, if, so that ratio of the ERP to outside the system I'm only in there 10% of the time. Right. Totally 100% understandable. Right. And logical. Yes. Because that person is in the ERP system to pull data out and then manipulate it in its proper format in Excel. Exactly. So 10% uh, ERP, 90% shadow ERP, perfectly acceptable. Yeah. Let's go to the production manager. Right. Okay. And in most good uh, ERP systems, there is a big easy button to run MRP. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Now, the easy button you can only push when there's a lot of stuff set up correctly. Right. Correct? Yep. And that's, there's a huge amount of stuff that has to be set up for the easy button to work. Exactly. So, so if everything's set up correctly, that production manager should go into the ERP system, hit the easy button and be done. Yep. If, however, that guy is spending 10% in the ERP system, downloading open orders, open production orders, <laughs> uh, and then pulling all this stuff down, right? Inventory yep. balancing. Yep. And pulling all that stuff down into this complex maze of macro-driven Excel spreadsheets exactly. where he's actually doing a bunch of manipulation and head scratching and, and moving data around and then figuring out, oh, here's what we need to order. And oh, here's the orders and here's the production orders that we should issue today. Yeah. Now that guy doing 10% in the ERP and 90% in the shadow ERP is completely 100% inappropriate. I agree. Yes, because what it shows is... Yep. Bad training, bad setup, bad yep. software, software, right? Exactly. And so you can track, you can track with our tool, you can track how those ratios move over time. Yeah. So you take an initial snapshot and say, oh my gosh, that department is 100% in the ERP doing everything. Fantastic. Must be working great. Yeah. This department over here, they're spending 80% of their time in Excel. 
what did we what did we not anticipate there? Exactly. Let's look. Yeah. Oh, they didn't get training on all this stuff. Or oh my gosh, we didn't turn on this function. We didn't implement that. Now you do some training, you flip a switch, you spend a billion dollars installing an entire new system. Exactly. Don't you don't you want to see how that um, ratio moves over time? Because you wanted to improve. So uh, if you were to try to gather that type of information with human beings, you need an army constantly watching everything. Exactly. It's almost impossible, which is why uh, having this tool that allows us to analyze the components, where are the trouble spots, and then calculate the ratios and watch how they change over time, that's we see that as you know the first big step forward in ERP productivity that I've seen in my uh, career. So we're really excited about um, you know using that for our customers. So very interesting, and we I definitely want you to unpack a little bit uh, more about the tool, how the tool works, and I don't know right. if it is going to be working with every single ERP system. You know, maybe describe the workflow of the tool a little bit more, but I want to touch on one more point, which you can probably uh, address that as well. And that is going to be most people not really understanding the difference between your controller workflow versus your production manager workflow. So you mentioned that, right. you know what, control if controller does that, that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. right. But if production manager does that, that's not acceptable. Now, people don't really understand why that is the case. In my mind, when I look at these things, there are two workflows. One is going to be your operational workflow because of which right. you are probably going to have downstream issues. And typically that is going to be the more upstream you are, the more trouble you are going to cause for the downstream people. Right. Typically accounting is going to be the easiest because they are the most foundational element. <laughs> and accounting right. is literally bulletproof, to be honest. Okay, Whatever you are going right. to mess up, they can probably fix it uh, underneath. So in their case, whatever time they are spending outside of the system, that's not going to have impact on anybody. So probably, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if that is the reason why it is acceptable. So touch on that and maybe talk a little bit more about the tool as well. Yeah, so the tool was originally came from and it came from a question that a customer asked. Okay. And a big shop with lots of people sitting on their computers. It was Microsoft AX back yeah. at the time. Sitting on their computer uh, answering customer service calls. So a big department answering a customer service call. And we had helped them with the AX implementation. And somebody asked the question, boy, I think, or I'd really like to know which customer where we compare how much money we're making from them versus how much time we spend with them on calls. Exactly. I would really like to know which customers are, you know, good customers. Yep. And which customers are a pain in the you know what, because they're killing us on all these time and questions and the amount of revenue is really justify that. Yep. And um, you know, my partner who was r running that engagement uh, said, oh, I can answer that question. And they said, you can. Well, for how much? And he threw out a number. Yeah, it was a big number. And they said, yes, we want to know. Do it. And at that time, he realized he should have he should have had a bigger number. But anyways, he understood that what we can do is we can include um, some code on the ERP software side that by user, by group, by department uh, reports which function, which screen that you're working yeah. versus other software and being able to map that over time. What you can actually do is you can say, okay, as a department, yeah, we were in these customer service screens this much time with that customer. And so that just very simply and very straightforward created the analysis of these are the customers, yeah. tie that information to how much money you make on them, and here's how much time we're spending with them. And all of a sudden, you're able to completely understand which customers are your best customers from a you know, customer service standpoint. And so then expanding that capability of understanding where the time is yeah. in various ERP functions 
and uh, software outside like uh, Excel. Yeah. Very straightforward um, data collection. And then the, um, you know, then the, uh, the reporting is the key piece, right? Because um, the key with most big sets of data yeah. is that you really have to act, have the expertise to understand what questions to ask the data. Right. And so that's where the experience with ERP and workflows and that type of understanding and how things work on a department by department basis yeah. allows you to create the correct reporting that then makes sense. So very interesting. So I don't know if uh, listeners are really able to follow along overall uh, from the how tool is going to work. So I sort of, and I'm actually going to paraphrase a little bit uh, so that they are able to relate. So here you are saying, and I don't know, you know, if this is only going to sit on top of AX or this is going to work, uh, you know, with any- It started with AX. It's okay, started with AX. Okay, okay. So right now, are you guys able to do for all of the ERP systems, just a couple of the ERP systems or? Because we, because we primarily live in a Microsoft world. Yeah. Uh, we're able, we're able to do this on all the Microsoft ERP solutions. Yeah. But it's a straightforward implementation to another ERP world. Okay. If there are partners or customers that are interested in this type of, uh, you know, technology. So very interesting. So my understanding is going to be this is going to be some sort of plugin that you are installing on top of ERP. You know, you are getting yeah. some sort of you know data from the ERP. But my concern right. is going to be, or my question or clarification that I probably need yeah. from your side is going to be that okay, so you are trying to measure this entire time for the whole transaction, and you are saying yeah. that you know what? Uh, yes, you are spending. Let's say inside the ERP, it's all easy because you already mm-hmm. have the data points. You can probably Look at, okay, if you have the order to cash process, okay, at what time the order was captured and then, you know, what happened to your shipment and invoice. And let's say if you are going outside of that for any of the process flow, you sort of know what is happening outside. So how are you sort of tying back that this external data? Is it going to be some sort of plugin? How do you know which spreadsheet are they going to use for the external process or how many software they are going to use? So how are you sort of computing the external time? So... I'm not the developer or a programmer, but from my understanding is in a Windows environment, yeah, it's very it's very easy uh, from a program by program standpoint yeah. to understand um, even on an even for emails uh, because a lot of people spend a ton of time on emails, so it's even possible as far as you know emails or you know doing things like being in a Teams call yeah. to measure. Uh, how much time you're spending in different applications. And a lot of these applications uh, will give you information as to things like uh, what project is this on or what's the name of the spreadsheet. And so if you have a spreadsheet that you're accessing over and over and over, you can start analyzing, you know, what type of data you're capturing in there or what it is you're doing in there. Yeah. So to me, um, it's been, the tool was, the tool has been around for many years. So there's been a lot of, um, there's been a lot of fine tuning on how to capture this data and how to analyze it. Yeah. And anybody that wants a deep, a deep technical dive on how this stuff is done, I'm happy to have my partner do that part. I, I stay away from the technology, you know, uh, deep dives. And I'm pretty sure the listeners who are interested in, uh, you know, that they'll, uh, they'll contact you, uh, you know, related to that. Um, so the other clarification that I'm probably going to need from your side, and I don't know if you're going to be comfortable uh, sharing mm-hmm. that or not, is going to be, so let's say if you are going from your process flow, uh, you know, you are mm-hmm. going from your point A to point B, there could be two mm-hmm. possibilities when you are doing that, right? So yes, two sir. possibility could be, number one, you are spending that time in a real process versus you are simply waiting. So I don't know if there is a way to differentiate between those two times. Uh, I don't know how you guys are differentiating because let's say if you are going to say that, you know what, my, I have my order to cash process and the total mm-hmm. time I know that from your order mm-hmm. to invoice is probably going to be 16 hours, Yeah, you know, but that 16 hours could be waiting time and that's not the actual yeah. process time. So how are you sort of differentiating? Any, any insights yeah. there by any chance? So one of the things I understand from my engineering background is the theory of large numbers. Yeah. So what we do is we capture so much data in a very short period of time uh, with this tool set that what ends up happening is that outliers get washed away. Yeah. 
And what that means is, you know, that one time when somebody left a screen open and went to lunch and came back and those those kinds of outliers get washed away with the theory of large numbers. So what starts happening is when you get a lot of uh, data points, the more data points you have, yeah, the more you're going to what they call regress to the mean, yeah, which means that the information that you're getting is going to be closer and closer to that actual time spent because you're getting your, you know, you're kind of normalizing and getting rid of that information at the extremes. Yeah. So to me, that's a great question because if you take snapshots, oftentimes you can be fooled by some big outlier. Yeah. And, you know, that was just an anomaly at that time. Yeah. But because the tool takes so much data and, you know, and we typically run this for one to two months before we make, um, you know, before we go in there and say, hey, this is, uh, you know, this is what we're seeing. Yeah. That um, it's that, like I said, it's the overabundance of data that allows you to hone in on the truth yeah. uh, much easier than snapshots. Yeah, exactly. So very interesting tool. So I don't know if you're going to have any sort of story from the business perspective, the business that really utilize the tool. So I, I don't know if you're able to provide any sort of story there for that business. You know, what were their original challenges when they were exploring the tool? Uh, and then finally, let's say they installed, what were some of the resistance that you got from the, the customer? And then was it successful? Was it not successful? You know, what were the lesson learned? So do you have any sort yeah. of stories that you might be able to share? So um, I'm going to um, I'm going to combine two concepts that are okay. I, I think about five years ago, yeah, I did a presentation in front of a group of uh, of ERP users, and at that point, I came out with the following theory, <laughs> yeah, which was if you take three simple criteria, yeah, for success of an ERP implementation. On time, yeah. On budget, and delivering promised functionality, yeah. Three very simple criteria. Based on those three simple criteria, I said out loud for the first time in front of a room full of people that it's my belief that on that enterprise, more sophisticated level of projects, there has never been a successful ERP implementation ever. Yep, I completely now, agree. When I first said that, I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm going to get thrown off the stage. <laughs> Interestingly, my uh, 20 per my 20 minute presentation ended an hour and 40 minutes later because of the back and forth it generated. Yeah. With horror stories and this that, and the other thing. And so since then, I thought a lot about if you go out and Google how to install ERP. You get millions of suggestions. Yep. Everybody knows how to do it right. Exactly. And then when you, and then when you Google ERP failures, there's just untold number of stories, including I believe now it's at least two billion dollar failures. Yep. And so my thought process is how can that be? And so at some point, at some point we started thinking, you know, let's break that down. Let's let's break down this failure with that what is it, the five whys approach? Yeah. And so if you think about it, you have a failed or challenged project. And and we specialize in those uh, for a long time. Why? Well, because they're over budget, they're over time, or they've missed scope. Okay. Why? Well, there were errors in the project plans. Why? Because of missed critical requirements, either intentionally or unintentionally. Yeah. Yep. Intentionally to get the business or unintentionally because you used an unsophisticated tool to gather the data. Exactly. And so why did we miss uh, critical requirements? Because our checklist data gathering was insufficient to capture everything that we did. Exactly. Why? Because that's the only tool we have. And so um, what we've been doing is when we talk to customers about upgrades or we talk to customers about implementing a new system, what we do instead of using 
the checklist gathering approach. Yeah. We run the insight program. And now we're capturing all the data that you typically get with a checklist. But we're also gathering and finding those shadow ERP components and those ratios indicating where it's really important. So now what we're able to do is we're able to deliver proposals and project plans at a much higher level of sophistication where the you know, opportunity for a customer and a relationship with a vendor, there's a much higher chance that there's good trust between the two, that what we have is an actual good plan and that we haven't missed anything critical. So to me, that's the big story is so many uh, challenge projects, yeah. so many failed projects. It's an epidemic. And it's it one is. of those things that the vendors hide. No vendor wants to talk about, exactly. oh, look at all these projects that have gone in the toilet and they're on their third uh, partner and they're going to sue the, those things are an epidemic. Yep. And so because everybody sees that, but nobody does anything about it, that's where we're really excited. And that's my story is we have this market where this is an ap epidemic, but everybody's doing things the same way. And we're trying to figure out what's the flaw that keeps these projects failing and being challenged and how do we address it? And so we may not have the answer, yeah. but we have, we have a potential answer and we're trying. So that's, that's the story. And that's where I'm excited um, as that, you know, that industrial engineering degree all comes back full circle yeah. because that's all about how to make things more efficient. So now we're trying to make, ERP implementation is more uh, efficient using the tool, using these concepts. And so that's that's why I'm so excited that hopefully we have, you know, introduced that first level of concepts and tool sets that perhaps uh, makes this a uh, better experience for that uh, customer and that implementation and having a higher chance of success. Okay, very cool. And I am super excited as well. And I'm pretty sure my listeners are going to be equally excited because there is a real pain with these ERP implementation. You know, obviously, yes, nobody wants to go through those million dollar disasters. Yes, it's, it's uh, extremely painful for everybody. Um, you know, and again, I think I'm going back to your point, whether it is done intentionally or unintentionally in both cases, right. uh, it hurts a lot. So on that note, this has been a powerful episode. Do you have any last minute closing advice? Uh, or remarks for our listeners by any chance? <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. Uh, thank you very much for having me. That, um, again, my hat's off to you. And I'm just looking forward to continuing the conversation with my with my customers. But I want everybody in the industry to start thinking about, let's stop doing things the same way over and over and over that leads to these, you know, challenge and failed projects. And let's think about what are those thoughts and tools that fixes that? Because I want to get away from that, you know, um, I want to get away from that bad feeling that people have about these implementations. So yeah. again, thank you very much. And um, like I said, I'm excited about uh, bringing some new thoughts and tools in an area where lots of challenges. So I'm excited. And thank you so much for your time and insights. And I am super excited about what you guys are going to do to make sure that, you know, people are going to be comfortable with the ERP implementation. Mm -hmm. On that note, Peter, I want to thank you for your time. This has been a powerful episode. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Of course. Bye. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you would like to learn more about Peter Jackal, head over to turnondynamics.com. It's T-O-R-N-O-N-D-Y-N-A-M-I-C-S.com. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Ravi Vedja, who shares his insights into workflow technologies and where they fit in the enterprise architecture. Also, the interview with Megan Gamble, who shares her insights into building the systems for the packaging industry. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word 
among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you, and I hope to get you on the next episode of the Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.